I'm just thinking where we should start <coughs> it from. I really do like that conversation we were having before. Yeah, I was going to say, do you want to carry on that conversation? Yeah. Okay. Because that was pretty, I think that's what I've been thinking about a lot because I've been ex I've been experiencing it firsthand. Okay. Um, this whole like, there's a stage personality. Okay. And then there's just the person, right? And we were talking before that, like my my goal with this podcast is to basically, you know, there's these conversations that happen at dinner, right, and at the bar and in the lobby during the breaks of the events, right, right. And those you said like those are the best parts, and I want to capture like some of those conversations, some of those like organic, just hanging out kind of conversations, yeah, because they're not anywhere like online. Instead, it's everyone do, like presenting their like their stage self. You know what I mean? Mm. Personally, what I've noticed is I will go to events for those conversations. Mm. Like especially now, it's like I need specific things for content, but I'm not really looking for content. I'm looking for the networking, like the event that we went to in San Diego the the round table where we were sitting and talking and it's like asking what are you doing what are you doing you know um those are the conversations that i'm very interested in and i really loved what you said about what was that person's name you said where he goes in like he turns up empty oh rick rubin yeah i mm. i love that because a couple times i have gone into places like i'll go to events and i'll see people like burning through notebooks especially now with events and all that when I did that, I never was, like I never did anything with my notes and half of the time I wasn't even paying attention. But the times when I did go without any intention and I would only write the things that really like stood out to me, those were the times that I really came out with some like really valuable stuff, you know? Mm. Yeah. Why do you think that is? I think you just, you just become free. Because when you go looking for a specific thing, your mind is searching mm. and it's not paying attention here now, right? It's searching. Okay, I'm look I'm looking for the I'm looking for keywords. I'm looking for this topic. Where if you just kind of like go with the flow and free up your mind to like just receive, I think we're all smart enough to like capture the things that are important, you know, and then leave off the things that are not important. And mm. then you know what's going on in your life, so you know this applies, this doesn't apply, you know? Mm. Mm. I think it's serendipity. Have you heard that word? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, if you watch older movies, right? like the movies I really like, which are from like 1989 to like 1999. Okay. <laughs> That's my favorite period for some reason. I think it's because they're, for one, they're, they're very like romantic. They're about, a lot of them are about love. But the other one is that there's so it's all about serendipity like someone just goes out for a walk and then something they run into something or they're getting these like signs that this is the right thing to do or something right which is how life really is and the really creative people have often learned how to be so like empty that they can still pick up on all of those things which is what makes really great creation right but that's all been removed now with like social media and, and all of this stuff. There's not much serendipity anymore. Well, see, and I think part of that conversation also was about Instagram and YouTube. And remember I was telling you, we like, we kind of took off on Instagram and that's like our thing, you mm -hmm. know? Um, but if I had to do it all over again, I would choose YouTube. Like I enjoy making YouTube content a hundred times more than Instagram because Instagram, it's like the lifespan, the, the time span of a human is like, I don't know, five seconds and you gotta capture them. Reels are only good for 30 seconds. Anything more than that, they just don't even perform. So it's like, I have seven lines that I have to get straight. You know, the the the, the exact way of, of saying it, I have to, like, I can't add words. I can't take out words where with YouTube, my YouTube guy says, hey, look, you've got like 20 minutes, 30 minutes, take your time, you know? And so I'm I'm sitting there and really saying the things that I want to say to the audience. And so it's more like I'm using my personal, um, what's the word? Like 
like I'm being very authentic and very raw. And I don't need to like, I guess, stage things, you mm. know, or I don't need to, like it's not optimized almost. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's what I love about it. I think that's the thing. It's the optimization. I think we're all optimizing for attention. And maybe that's why there is that, you know, you were talking about. I think about. it's the faking, which has to be done to fit something <clears throat> into such a small format. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Okay. But you know what's interesting? I've heard, like I, I was hanging out, I was just at Cole's event, right? Right. And I was hanging out with some, the younger generation dudes. They're like 21 and they're, crushing it with um, TikTok. So I was really curious about this. And I asked them like, how do you take off on TikTok? And they said their main thing is a podcast. So they do, they hang out and just jam and let things just, they just talk about whatever. Right. Sometimes they said it's like a new person that's trending in the industry, sometimes just whatever's on their mind, right? Okay. Or sometimes it's about girlfriends, their pro productivity, sleep, whatever's on their mind. They just jam in the podcast and it's long form. But there's always these moments. Like, you know, if you have a conversation for two hours, there's bound to be at least two or three highlights, right? right? And he said they they that's the whole reason they do the hanging out is to grab the the highlights. highlights. And then they have a <clears throat> someone that formats it and edits it so that it goes viral on TikTok. Um so it's interesting that we're talking about this because some guys I've met that are crushing it on TikTok actually use the proper conversations as the like um, idea ground or idea like discovery ground, right? Mm. For that material. Does that make sense? Well, I mean, you know, love them or hate them, but isn't that how Andrew Tate blew up? Yeah. A lot of the, the, the material that I've seen of him online, it's just podcasts it's it's clips from podcasts that he's cut up or mm. other people have cut up and put online you know so you're 100 percent right which is kind of cool i think because i never could do the short form content because mm. i'm not going to sit down with a phone with tiktok and think how can i make a 30 second clip every day right, right. like come on <laughs> um, and then you also have to do it for YouTube shorts and reels. Yeah. I'm like, your whole day's gone. Yeah. What do you? So I've never been able to do that. But it seems like people are figuring out a new model to like satisfy all the platforms mm. with one kind of organic piece of content that then just gets cut up and distributed in many different formats. Mm. And that's one of the reasons why I started doing podcasts. Mm. Like I was, for the longest time, I told my team, I'm not, I'm never gonna uh, speak on stage. I'm not gonna appear on podcasts. I'm not gonna do anything. I don't have time for this shit. I'm just literally, I'm running the business. That's what, you know, I don't mm. have time for this stuff. Until I did one, it was for Maria. She's oh, a yeah. uh, part of your, uh, your, um, your mastermind. Mm. And uh, she said, hey, I'm gonna be in, in uh, Miami. Can we please me? I would love to interview you. And I, first time I said no. And then someone else reached out and it was gonna be around the same time. And so I was like, you know, if I'm gonna do this, I would, you know, might as well do that. And it just so happened that I did three back to back, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And after I came out of it, I was like, holy shit, I really enjoy this conversation because again, a lot of the content that I have been producing over the last couple of years has been like optimized. It needs to be optimized for clicks, conversions, all that stuff. Where I'm going into the podcast, like just like you said, just turning up empty, literally no agenda, nothing. Mm. I'm just here, this is who I am. Is there anything that you don't wanna talk about or anything you wanna talk about? Nope, I'll just follow your lead. And we start and after an hour, hour and a half, I'm like, I'm actually pretty smart. I said some pretty smart things, you know? And so I would just give it to our marketing team and then it's like they have an hour, hour and a half that they can do whatever they want with it. We'll upload it on YouTube, you know, full version, we'll cut it up, put it on Instagram, shorts, whatever, you know? It's funny you say that. Have not Have you found that you've been, you surprise yourself that you knew things you didn't even know you knew and you you sound smarter than you thought you were when you show up empty? 100%. <laughs> 100%. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's always how I've been. If I sit down with a keynote, I'll tear myself apart. Yeah. <laughs> pretty fast. Um, 
Or if I sit down to try and make a, like, to put what's in my mind into a one-minute clip, like... Yeah, that, that never works for me. I mean, you know, usually for, like, short form, it's always scripted. I can't mm. do... So I hate scripts. I don't do scripts. But for a short form like that, it's like, explain how to sell on Amazon in 30 seconds. How the fuck am I supposed to do that? Mm. You know? So they just give it, okay, here's what you need. Literally, line by line, I just read it off. And it's like, I just look, I read, I look, I you know? And then they edit and they do all that stuff to it. Um, but long form, I can't do scripts. So what no format way. have you mastered? Because you were like Instagram, that's your thing, right? As far as mastered in terms of like optimization and, and conversion is short form. But as far as what I enjoy is this, mm. yeah. So do you think there's a way though that you can do this and then turn it into that short form? So, yeah, so obviously this is like what everyone is doing right now, it seems like. Like Alex Harmozy, this is how he blew up. Although he does original content for like YouTube and stuff like that and sometimes for Instagram as well. But um, a lot of his stuff on Instagram is long form, cut up, and then put into short form. Um, but if you're trying to optimize, like, I think, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Bradley does the same thing. You know, obviously what's his name does the same thing. Um, Andrew Tate does the same thing. But I think if you're trying to optimize for conversion, it's a little different. Mm. So w what our strategy is short form conversion, long form nurturing and building trust over time, building brand. Like right now, YouTube literally generates zero of our sales mm. directly. Mm. Like we don't have people that click, you know, opt into the funnel and, and buy directly from YouTube, but they come from short form. But I feel like YouTube is our retargeting. Mm. Why do you think you have to do it different for conversions? I guess short answer would be, this is how we found that it's worked. Yeah. Mm. You know what I mean? Because what's interesting is there are people that get a lot of conversions that haven't optimized it for conversions. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? But they just have such a big, I guess, fan base mm. that, yeah, it's like these, I've noticed these kind of two worlds that have emerged recently. Okay. There's like, the people that optimized everything for, for conversions and they're often making a lot of money. And then there's the people that just built a really good like brand or audience or whatever. Right. Extreme version would be like Mr. Beast, right? Right. They still get a ton of conversions, which is what's interesting. Mm. Mm. Do you I ever th think about this, these two worlds? And we recently have shift. So we, I think um, you do, this is my opinion. I think you do need, you need somewhere in the middle. You can't go too far here, and you can't go too far here. Here mm. being too far in the conversion side, or too far in the in the like in the branding, unless if you already have other channels producing you income, mm. right? Kind of like what Grant Cardone says. You know, I, I feel like this this is Gary V. This is Grant Cardone. When I think of like you know two big influencers online, uh, Gary's is talking about the long you know the long term. Just give it all for free. It'll come back. Grant is like no sell right now, you know? Mm. Um, for a while there, we went absolute conversion. Absolute, you know, optimiz optimizing for conversion. We want it right now. And this is when we scaled the most, right? But I feel like there is a ceiling that you will hit with that. Mm. I feel like that, you know, if you could somehow optimize for both at the same time, because you do need that um, that brand building, you know? Um, and that's what we're trying to do with longer form content. And also now trying to, like taking these podcasts, chopping them up, and then adding this value stuff within our short form. Because the way that we do short form now is 60% value, 40% converting content. So the value would be things like this, you know, 30 seconds, 60 seconds from here, that's value that we add and then the other 40% would be like optimized for conversions, click the link and buy or go here to buy or something like that, you know? Mm, got it. Yeah, I think you're right. Like there is a balance. So mm. you're trying to go, you've been kind of hard jammed on the conversion side yes. for a long time. Yes. And now you're trying to like balance. balance it. Yes. So what's, 
your podcast, you what's it called? It's not my podcast. I just appear on podcasts. Oh, so you don't have your no, own? No, one. I don't have my oh, own okay. podcast. Yeah. Are you planning to do one? Um, I've been told that I should. I might with time. Honestly, I don't know. Right now, I, I don't see it for, for the next twelve months. No. So what's your content strategy then for like next twelve months? Um, pretty much doing exactly what we're doing. Uh, which is again short form conversion, long form brand building, nurturing, and just uh, um, talking about whatever the fuck I want to talk about, and not worrying about is this gonna get views, is this gonna get clicks, is mm. this gonna get whatever. I you know like I just came out of a, a five day seminar with Tony Robbins, which was very intense, and there are like a million things on my mind right now that I want to share they necessarily aren't going to convert people into buying tomorrow, you know? Mm. But I know there are things that uh, that I feel like I want to share with the world, the world needs to know about, and that people will benefit from. So I try to do that on my stories a lot as well on Instagram. Um, like my Instagram stories, I do zero conversion, is just whatever's on my mind. But then I'll also do long form on, on YouTube. Oh, I see. And what's your long? What's your style for like long form YouTube? Uh, so what do you, what do you like, mean? What's the concept of how you're going to make content? Like, what is it? We have a an idea finder that gives me like because you do need some virality to it, right? Because the idea could be great, that's awesome. But if you want people, like if you really think that this is a good idea that you want people to know about, it does need some virality aspect to it. Right, mm. so not like clickbaity, but it needs to be some needs to have some vi virality to it. So he'll find a viral idea, and then he'll bring it back to me and say, "These are five things that I found that are viral. Can you talk about them in your own style? Mm. Do whatever you want. Just make sure that it's it's relevant." Or sometimes I'll go to them and say, "Hey, there are three things that I want to talk about," and they'll go out and find a viral concept that can be um, used. And, and for me to deliver on that, and then I'll produce content for that. Mm, got it. And okay, so that makes sense. So you're doing content for YouTube like that, and you're also doing stories on Insta. Yes. And then you're also doing the conversion content stuff. On on the feed. And that has a, a four prong um, um, like strategy for our uh, Instagram. So the first thing, it needs to be viral. Second thing, it needs to be personal. Number three, it needs to be uh, relevant, relevant to the brand. And number four, I always forget this, can't remember it. I'll probably remember it and I'll tell you about it. Cool. Yeah. Do you find it hard to make content like for YouTube when you've, when it's kind of in a way like it's not so natural, right? Because you're trying to find what would go viral and then you're trying to think, how can I talk about something? Do you have any problems doing that or is it? can you make it, is it pretty easy? No, it doesn't happen every week. Sometimes okay. I'll skip a week. Oh, got it. Yeah, so yeah. I have a day where it's like on Saturdays, it's two hours, I need to produce at least one, two videos if I'm on the roll. Uh, but sometimes I'll just go and I'm like, I don't fucking feel like doing this. And I'll like, I'll see myself getting distracted, getting distracted with other stuff. Yeah. And then I'll do other stuff and it's like, ah, fuck it. I'll just... Catch this again next Saturday. If I don't feel like it, I won't do it. You just ex described my last like eight years. <laughs> because otherwise it Sometimes just comes Sometimes I off. just went fuck it for two years. Well, <laughs> I haven't gone that far. Yeah, I haven't gone that far. But it's like you, when you force it, you could tell that it's forced. Oh, yeah. You know? And it doesn't come out right. And it's like it's a short video and it's very forced. And I'm like stopping. Like I know it's a good video when I don't stop. It's one take. Mm. I know this is a good fucking video. If yeah. I stop more than once, twice, it's like, okay, I need to redo this. I, I'm, I'm stepping off, mm. you know? Yeah. I know exactly what you mean. I've been tortured by this for a long time. And people would even say in the comments of my videos, it looks like Sam is like being held at gunpoint <laughs> to make this video. And that's funny. I used to laugh because I was like, damn, that's exactly what it feels like. And so... Then I noticed like some of the videos I made that I had fun with, mm. they crushed. And people said, I love this, I love this. And I was like, people can, after enough of that, I really picked up that people could feel what I was feeling in a video. Yeah. And so I was like, damn, there's something to this, right? Like when you feel good, you're just 
like video is really just a high bandwidth like feeling channel 100 percent. so like people are looking to feel inspired or they're looking to feel like motivated or determined or like they're looking for feelings right um and yeah when i forced it it just couldn't happen um but you I, what i find interesting is you said you um Press yourself with how much you know and how smart you are when it's when you show up empty. Yes. And it just flows. So why not do that as your main format? So the thing that I've been like in battle with for two years now is where do I put my attention? And what's more consistent? And what's more like 10 years from now? Is it best to grow Bashar? Is it best to grow, you know, BJK University. And the reason why I want to ask you this, because you've done both, kind of, right, in a way. Although different industry, a little bit, but you've grown Sam Ovens for a while, and then you had consulting, but really with Sam Ovens, but now you're, I don't want to say going away, but like you're more focused on school, mm. right? So what are my thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, it kind of depends what you want to achieve. Like, for most creators, course creators, influencers, whatever you want to call them, it's just way easier to build a personal brand, right? Sure. Because people are looking to connect with people on social media, on, on everything, right? And that's just the easiest way to do it and get started, I think. Um, plus, the, co the cool thing about it is your name really never changes. So it gives you a lot of flexibility, right? Because if you go into brand too early, you know how when you're an entrepreneur, you typically change paths a few times, sure. right? And yeah. you have to throw away all of what you've built when you commit to a brand too early. Um, so I think it's probably best to start building a personal brand. And that will feed you for a long time if you just want a, a good business, right? Like even look at Tony Robbins and, and some of these guys, like they, they still use their personal name yeah. and they've gotten huge, right? Or Grant Cardone, right? So I think for the vast majority of people, that's totally fine. But if you really want to go like beyond that, and I haven't really seen anyone do it really well, mm. you need to create more of a platform for other people personalities mm. so the personalities are never like you can never get around them like there needs to be personalities but it's more like a platform for personalities to shine interesting yeah mm. so this is kind of our plan is because the more um it's kind of like you know a perfect example for anyone watching this that would resonate with her that knows is alex harmozy you know he started as the gym guy and then from there he went like i know even his early on videos it was about, well, I don't want to be known as the guy that helps gyms anymore. I want to be known as the guy that helps businesses, you know? And so the one thing that I've not battled with, but like I'm known to be the Amazon guy. Mm. I don't even actively sell on Amazon for the last two years. I'm an Amazon investor now. So I invest in Amazon businesses, right? And so my thing is our long-term plan for for BJK University is to grow into other verticals, right? Because we see ourselves as a university, people come to us to acquire a skill they can turn into income, right? And improve their lives. Right now it's Amazon. This was the vehicle we started with. I was an Amazon seller, grew into that. And so my thing is, how do I go from being the Amazon guy to this guy that's now also has these offerings without looking like a, a niche hopping guru, you know what I mean? Mm. And so my plan was, okay, as you said, what if we acquire smaller influencers and BJK University does become like a platform and then it, you know, these guys come under the umbrella of BJK University teaching Airbnb, teaching crypto, teaching remote sales, teaching copywriting, whatever, mm. right? Um, but it feels like Bashar might always be the Amazon guy because that's what he got known for. Or do you think I would be able to remove myself from that and be more of, I'm um, this big umbrella, there's BJK University, and there's all these personalities under? I think you can definitely do it, mm. right? Um, you, 
like 100 percent, you can do it right mm. um i think that would be a good idea like to get you know you you're using your bashar and amazon to get to where you are you created bjku which is like very dominant in that vertical of amazon right, right? but now you're wanting to be more known for business well the beauty of that is that by doing Amazon, you've already proven that you're good at business. Right. So you've already been developing that skill. But the only thing that's, and now you could create BJKU as the platform and you could put some more verticals on it. People always think of you as that until you master another vertical, right? But then I personally won't be mastering the vertical. No. Right. But you're doing it through someone else. Right. Now you'll start to earn that like reputation as Bashar, who was good with Amazon, but now he has BJKU and he has these other people okay. like XYZ. Okay. Got him. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, because that's always like every person I say it to, they're like, dude, that's a badass idea. But then I think there's some deep down concern of I don't want to look like, you know, all these other guys that went from this thing to this thing to now this other thing because this is the hot thing. You know what I mean? Mm. And so that's always the concern in the back of my mind. Well, you won't because you're not trying to do it, mm. right? Yeah. That's where everyone goes wrong. They are the Amazon guy and then they're like, no, actually it's crypto. And then they're like, no, actually it's this. And so they're always like, they're always jumping and they're always throwing away what they built. So you have to like maintain what you built. Right. And the only way really to master many things is to get multiple people. And that will be the challenge, right? right. Just how do you find that talent? And I think you have to find them early to get them on your like platform and and loyal to you. You know what I mean? Early in their journey. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Mm. That's interesting. I have my eyes on a few people in this mastermind, so mm. you know, might reach out to you in a couple of years to tell you, hey, can you make some connections? <laughs> so why do you want to do that? Like why why multiple personalities? Well then what would be the other option? I guess you could just keep doing Amazon. We will, um, and we won't move, not away from it, but we won't add another thing until we grow. But I do want, like I do see our company, a multi-billion dollar year company. Mm, That's okay. my so goal. So you want to be very big. Very big, yeah. Why? Um, number one, because no one has done it. I want to be the guy that breaks the four, you know, four minute mile. Um, number two, because I do have a mission to impact people's lives. Um, and I believe that through education, so it's, it's, it's a few few reasons. The first thing is I do believe that our traditional education system is broken. And I do believe that this online education thing that has come about over the last decade or so is really the way for the future because you can come and acquire a skill, a very specific skill in a month, two months, three months, six months, and actually do something with it. Mm. And instead of going to school for four or five years and hopefully getting somewhere, right? So I do believe, I do strongly believe in education and for that specific reason. I do want to help people um, a lot of people are stuck in the, this is not for me, I don't think I can do it, limiting beliefs, right? And what we've realized through our program is that we can take someone and teach them skills all day, but if their mindset doesn't shift, I don't care who you are, they just won't do it. They'll find an excuse not to do it. So the, re the, the, the way to shift these people's mindsets is to position yourself as the, I'm gonna fix your finance guy, but then I'm gonna give you all this stuff. It's kind of like, sell them what they want, give them what they need, right? Because it's easier to go to someone that's in debt and say, I'm gonna teach you how to make $10,000 a month, then I'm gonna help you, you know, help your mindset. Mm. Tell you, go fuck yourself. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about, mm. you know? So with that said, I do believe that I, with Amazon I can grow, but I don't believe that I can fulfill how big I wanna grow the company because I wanna be able to touch every single human on planet Earth at some point, mm. you know? just because I do believe in education. Um, and then I also do believe in opportunities and I love opportunities. Like that's the thing that drives me today is the opportunities that I'm providing my team. 
And I know that the bigger I can grow a company, the more opportunities I can create for them, you know? Why do you care so much about opportunities? Have you thought where all of this desire comes from or like where it, do you ever think about that? Yeah, I do. I, I And this is one of the reasons why I, um, I've really enjoyed following Tony Robbins over the last few months. So he talks about the um, he talks about these concepts of the science of it of of um, the science of achievement and the art of fulfillment. So the science of achievement is like building a successful business, um, you know, going to school, getting a degree, becoming a lawyer, whatever, right? So you accomplish something. You're a a uh, you're uh, um, what's his name uh, Tiger Woods, and you became the, the the best golfer in the world, right? You achieved something. Once you achieve that thing, if you don't find what fulfills you, you will feel very miserable mm. because the worst thing in life is to drive for something all of your life, accomplish it, and then feel empty. Mm. And usually that comes from, it's all about me, it's about my needs, it's what I want, right? Mm. But then the art of fulfillment is about how can I find joy in every moment? How What can I do to like find fulfillment in the things that I do? And humans find fulfillment in two things, growth and contribution. Growth is personal growth. It's growth at the gym. It's growth in your relationships. It's growth everywhere. We all need progress. And contribution is giving back to other people. Mm. So when I had finally cleared my debt after my restaurant burned down, I got to a point where Okay, I'm making, I mean, I wasn't making millions of dollars every single month, but I was making more than the normal person would make. And it felt very empty. I had never made that much money in my life, but it felt very empty. And that's when I knew that there was more to life than just serving my needs and interests and desires. And I bought a Bentley and then I was going to buy a Rolls Royce. And then, you know? Yeah, I know. Mm. Yeah, I've been through that. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Yeah. The problem I had was like, you know, I'd set a financial target, hit it, and then I couldn't get out of bed for a few weeks. Yeah. And then I'd set another one, got me out of bed, I'd hit it. Nothing. Same thing again. Mm. And I was like, man, this is so unproductive. Yeah. It's like, I need to set something that will take me the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. Because then you've never achieved it. That's I right. think that's the key. Yeah. Yeah. So you kind of set one of those. Yeah. Mm. I know I'll never achieve it, and mm. that's good. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool when you do that, right? Very cool. Mm. And the other thing is you inspire others as well. That's the thing that I've noticed. Like this year, we've we've grown 60 70% than last year, but we've had a tough year in terms of growing so much and contracting. And I mm. mean, we've talked about it, you know, many times. But something that's kept the people together is that mission. It's that bigger than themselves purpose. Mm. And I think that's necessary for the individual and for the organization as well to stay healthy. And you used to run very <clears throat> not like, you didn't used to operate in a way that you loved. You used to be looking for financial targets and approaching it very like in a basically muting your feelings. And now you're trying to do it with passion, it sounds like? 100% with passion, mm. yes. Yeah, that's an interesting thing too, because I've seen a lot of people have been, I think Hormozy shared some video where he said, forget about your feelings, you just, you should want to win by not wanting to lose. Mm. Do you remember hearing this one? Yeah. 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 Which is a very like Tiger Woods way to go about, um, yeah. to go about business. And that's kind of interesting. I mean, it can work, but I don't think that's the best way. I call it the scarcity and abundance mindset. Mm. So <clears throat> late last year, we had one of our pod leaders come to Aaron, our head of sales, and he said, I have a problem. I said, what's your problem? He said, I can't get my top closers to close more. It's like, okay, why? It's like, they're making too much money. Mm. It's like, okay. And he's like, dude, for me, because he, he used to be, so the pod leader used to be homeless. 
And at that point, I was making like 25 grand a month. And he's like, for me, the thing that keeps me going is homelessness. I don't want to become homeless anymore. Mm. And then I had a conversation with him and I said, well, let me ask you a question. How much do you have in the bank? At the time, I think he said he had like 100, 120,000 or something like that. I said, at what point do you think you're going to get to a certain point, you're going to look at your bank and say, okay, even if I stop earning money right now, I've got a, a year, two years worth of, you know, worth of leeway in the bank. Mm. It's like, you know, you're not going homeless anytime soon. Don't you think that scarcity is going to run out? Mm. And he said, I don't know, but I'm not there yet. And so his thing was, I don't know how to create the same scarcity for them. And I said, well, that's when it needs to go from scarcity to mo to, to abundance. Mm. Because now you, you have so much abundance of resources, and that's when it needs to go from that, you know, again, the, the, the achievement to the fulfillment. It's like, how do I make it? Because in the beginning, it's all about me and we. And then it becomes about them. And that's the contribution part, where you shift your values from... I want to hoard money or I want to help myself and maybe my spouse, maybe my family, but it's like, how much are you going to help them? You know, you're going to buy your parents a house. You're going to buy them a car. They're 67 years old. I mean, how much longer they're going to live, you know? At some point, you're going to have to, I mean, what are you going to do with all that money that you're making? And uh, and I think this is also one of the reasons why a lot of the the wealthier people get into philanthropy and things like that, you know, obviously for tax reasons, sure, but it's also just feels good, mm. you know? And when you make it about other people, about the abundance, about like something that's pulling you in the future then rather than you pushing all the time, I think that becomes the true driver. At least that's that's what it is for me. I'm not sure. Mm. Have you noticed that yourself? In terms of motivating others? In terms of making the motivation for you about others. So I think what motivates me the most, if I was to really think about it, right, yeah. is just building things. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, I had to look back <laughs> in my childhood to figure that out and talk to my parents. And I was really trying to figure out what's this common, like, theme, right, that that I've always been doing just in different forms. It might okay. be building, like, a race car or a tree house or, you know, Lego or a computer all the way to now it's like a business and when i built the business and it was done and it worked i got bored of it immediately so that's why i had to commit to build something that would take me like a lifetime mm. and so for me it's building things that is my primary number one motivation thing okay but to build something really big you have to build it for other people well, I was going to say, you're yeah. not building it for yourself, right? You're building it for others. You're bringing communities. You're like, you're helping us and our communities tremendously, you know? True. Yeah. That is absolutely true. Yeah. But I, if I was to be completely honest with my primary motivation, yeah, this is just a fancy Lego. Okay. Like primary. Okay. But if I want, people have to use it. Otherwise, why am I building it? It's like building a city and no one occupies it, right? Sure. It means you didn't build something cool. Right. So people need to use it, which means I'm building, it has to be very good for them, right? Right. Um, but that, yeah, that's probably not my primary motivator. Okay. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, because sure. it's kind of nuanced. But yeah, that's that's what I realized. Have you looked back at the common threads in your whole <coughs> life? Um, in terms of like why, what drives me today drives me today? Like, have you ever wondered what is the thing that, like, you're building things? Yeah. What is your one of that? So there was a lot of giving in my life. Mm. Uh, my dad built a uh, a church in northern Iraq um, in a village where we're originally from, like our ancestors are from and stuff like that. And he's helped, like, he was known to be a giver, you know? He's helped a lot of his uh, brothers and sisters go through school. He was, um, at 14 years old, <clears throat> he would like go to work at his dad's shop because he became sick. And he helped all of his uh, kid brothers and sisters go through school and stuff like that and support the family. But then he later on um, 
took a rundown business to the second largest clothing factory in Iraq. And he was very wealthy in the 80s and 90s up until mid 90s when the economy in Iraq just went upside down. And that was my biggest motive in life. It was my mom wanted me to become a doctor, but then I really, I idolized my dad and I wanted to be like him. I wanted to be, um, I guess you could say a builder, but it was more of a, a person in power because I saw how he was respected by the community, you know? And, and then as I grew up, the contribution thing came back to me. And I started, as, as I started doing it more, I started enjoying it more. And then I just said, okay, how do I build a business out of this? How do I make it so big that I can literally contribute to everyone mm. while making myself rich, while taking care of myself and my family, you know? Interesting. Mm. So you wanna, you really wanna like help people, give to people. I do, in a profitable get, way, of and course. And get big. 100%, mm. in a profitable way, because it's like, you know, if, if I'm not running a business in a you know in a profitable way, I can't do that. Mm. And that and that's another mindset shift that I just recently became aware of because I started looking at how I was compensating people and was disgustingly high, you know. And then I started looking at the bottom line that started shrinking. And then I started realizing that if I keep this going, we will get to a way, a, a place where I cannot fulfill my absolute desire of helping people. Mm. And so this is, um, again, I'm gonna bring uh, Tony Robbins' name uh, again. This weekend, we, we learned this levels of consciousness that you have. And then it's like, you know, it's pretty much starts from scarcity and it goes into abundance, but then there is this level right before he calls it the green, it, it's like colors, different uh, levels, uh, they have colors. Green level, it's about where you get to a point where you are successful where you are doing well, but you're all about giving. It's all about giving, you just wanna give, you just wanna give, and you're not thinking about your own interest. And then there's literally a level right after that where you become so aware that you can go up and down in the conscious levels at every single situation. You could be the asshole if you need to be, you could be the complete giver if you need to be, you could be the, the little tougher or softer, however you wanna be. And, and for me, literally, I went to, to my whiteboard once I got home last night, and I'm like, green, arrow, yellow, you know? And now I look at it all the time. It's like, all right, I need to be in the yellow place because I'm so green right now. It's all about giving other people, you know? Mm. And that's great. But it's like, if you don't take care of the house, who else will, you mm. know? Yeah. Yeah, I totally get what you're saying there. It's interesting that you said that you mentioned your dad because... My dad was a, is a builder. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you've talked about that. Yeah. Mm. So I was always going to building <laughs> sites, and mm. and I wanted to be an architect. Mm. But then I met some architects, and they were like, "You don't want to be an architect," because <laughs> they were like, "You won't get to design what you want." Interesting. Mm. And so, it's interesting. There's actually a lot of architects in software. Like architects make really good software engineers. Mm. Mm. Okay. Um, but it's funny you mention your dad because that's why I always go back to like the childhood experience because that often is very revealing because it's before money was involved. Right. Money kind of, money and status and all of these things like pull, pull you in different ways, right? But when you're very pure and young, there's generally something there. Yes. And when you build a business around that, that's when it really takes off. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I totally get what you're saying about you know, you can't just always be a giver because then you'll have nothing to give. Right. Mm. Yeah. I think there is a balance there. There's definitely a balance. Well, you have there. to figure out how you want to give. Right. I think. Sure. Mm. Because, yeah. Because to, yeah, it's kind of like, how are you optimizing the whole thing, right? Yep. Mm. Interesting. So what's on your mind the most at the moment? Like, <clears throat> in general like what what have you been thinking about the most um you know one time you talked about i don't know if it was a video or if it was one of the events 
But you said there is, I think you brought the, the example of like bodybuilding. There is this, you bulk and then you got to cut. I think you said, you know, you bulk, you break things and you got to go back and like clean after yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. And so this is kind of the phase that the company's at. Um, is in that like cleaning up. We bulk too much and then we're cleaning up building systems and stuff like that. But the thing that I personally am thinking about is how do I, and I don't know if this is the right way of thinking or not, but how do I create an identity that is detached from my business? Because over the last 12 years, the only thing that I've been chasing has been financial success and improving my skills in that space. But six months ago, I was faced with a health crisis and that put me in a place to start thinking of other areas of my life. Because especially over the last couple of years since I moved to Miami, I've absolutely neglected everything, relationships, all that stuff. And so I created five pillars to success and that's health, relationships, spirituality, wealth, and contribution, right? And so right now, the thing that's on my mind is how can I create, you know, people talk about life work balance, oh, yeah. but for me, it's about, it's not even about balance. It's how do I create life, life integration, I guess you could say. How do I integrate all those things together? Mm, harmony. Right. Mm. And, and make sure that I'm not being pulled in one direction too much. Yeah. Because the other thing that happened was over the last three, four months, because I was pulled in, in the direction of business for such a long time, I was like, okay, I'm gonna like really care about my myself. So I started getting massages every week. I started doing oxygen therapy. I started seeing all these doctors. I started doing acupuncture. I started doing all these different things. And then I looked at my calendar and like four mm -hmm. days were like, all these different doctor appointments and stuff like that. And I'm like, okay, I've gone a little too crazy on this side now, mm. you know? So now it's like, how do I create a life where everything is involved and not one thing is taken up too much time for me, but I can show up and be present in all areas of my life, you know? Because I also am married. I also have kids, uh, not kids, planning on having kids. I also have parents. I also have, you know, all these different things. And so how do I create that, as you said, harmony? So that way I'm not being pulled in one direction. So that's the thing that I am working on right now. Mm. Yeah, I know what you mean. Hey, do you have any ideas? Well, I guess you've, but you're experimenting, right? But you're leaning too far into different parts. Yeah, and, and I think one thing that I am in discovery for is creating, establishing an identity that's, Bashar, not BJK University, that's not attached to the business, it's mm. my identity. BJK University is just one part, it's one leg. Mm. You know, you don't see, chairs don't have one leg, right? They have four different legs. So it's like, if one goes, it's very possible that the chair could tip over, but you know, how do I make sure that everything is balanced? So I'm working on creating the, uh, that identity. The other thing is my, goals for you know for the new years it used to be always financial goals mm. i never thought of anything else i was all right this is where we at at the business this is where i want to end up the year and now i'm creating three or four goals that aren't have nothing to do with you know with with the business it's like i have a health goal or fitness goal i have a relationship with my wife goal i have a contribution goal you know and then i have my business goal Mm. You know? Mm. Do you know what helped me a lot? What? Sounds kind of weird, but buying a house. Okay. And then having a kid. Okay. Because all of a sudden it made me think about my personal life as like another kind of company with mm. equity and shareholders in a, in a sense, right? Okay. Because, you know, a family all of a sudden is like, a new entity, kind of like a company. Sure. Because it's a family. You say family instead of like two people, right? Right. And then the asset is like the property, right? Mm. Which is shared by both of you. And there's even a shareholders agreement in a way, which is like 
the marriage certificate and everything. Sure. And then you're a team. And then when you've got a, a kid, it's like you have to communicate really good and you have to plan and schedule. And the kid is developing, which is kind of like a company too. It's growing, uh -huh. right? And then when you own a place, you tend to have like a roadmap. It's kind of interesting. Like, you know, in a company, you have a roadmap of initiatives to improve the product or sure. the company. You have that at home for like, I don't know, maybe you want to, maybe you want to like plant some trees or whatever, or, you know, okay. and so now you've got a project together and, and like a future and, and everything. Um, and it's, so you start think there's like a whole world there. And then you go out to go to work and that's where you're doing this world here. Mm. And this one has to be going well for <laughs> this one to go well. And this one has to go well for that one to go well. Cause when I come home, I'm like, it's very good for me to kind of like recharge and get a different perspective on things. Okay. But then when I go to work, I'm just focused in that, which is very good for me too. I kind of think about it as like in the ancient times, how you had your castle. And then you would leave your castle to go and like, you know, defend the land or whatever, right? Sure. But then you would come back to the warm castle again. But you would get bored if you're at the castle for too long. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. there's some really nice balance there. Are you doing everything in one place? Well, that was that was going to be my question for you. Do you do work at home? But for me, yes, it's it's all at home. I work mm. from home. Yeah. I So I see how that can happen because... Like, when do you switch modes? You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, the, there's literally no switching modes. I have implemented, like, um, time. Mm. So 6 p.m. work stops, um, and I come out of the office. And then I don't do work outside of the office. Mm. Um, so I used to, like, sometimes take my laptop, sit on the balcony. You know, we live on the beach, and so it's a nice, uh, nice view. Or sit on the couch and put up my legs or something like that. But I stopped doing that. Mm. Because then that carries over to whatever, you know? Um, and then that was impacting my relationship with my wife negatively, mm. right? Because it's like, you know, and it's like you hear women say, you're not there. I don't feel like you're there. And it's like, what the fuck are you talking about? I'm sitting right next to you. Mm. <laughs> but it's like, no, dude, you're not there, like, emotionally, mentally. You're there physically, but that doesn't mean anything, mm. you know? Do you work only in the office or do you also do some work at home? <clears throat> it's mostly the office. Okay. Yeah. Because I know when you lived in New Zealand for a while, you were working out of the house. Oh, yeah. I've worked at the house before yeah. for long periods of time. So I fully know what that's like. Okay. Yeah. And do you think that's helped out? Yeah. Okay. Except I need to work with people. This is another thing which kind of goes into this harmony we're talking about. Yeah. Um. Work for me, if I'm too isolated, is... It's not, it doesn't do much for me, like mm. emotionally or spiritually or whatever. I need to be around other people. That's what I realized. And so, you know, I need, my work becomes a lot more enjoyable and I don't get burnt out anywhere near as fast when I'm around other people. So I've kind of, I'm kind of trying to design everything in a way that's really, that creates a harmony, right? But what about creative work? Because that's the thing that I've noticed is that, like, if I'm going to go into a project or something like that, I need to put on my headphones. I can't hear, like, noise. And I can, like, sometimes I would try to do it, say, next to my wife, and I can't. I have to be, like, just in my zone. That's how I used to approach it. Okay. With extreme control of removing, like, um, interference. But... I, I honestly do it better if I'm in a room with smart people. Interesting. Yeah. Nothing is better for me than that. Because I can turn up not in the mood or tired or negative even. And very quickly I'm out of it <clears throat> because someone else... It, the beauty of working with other people I've found is that someone's generally not in a bad mood. And that brings everyone out. Got it. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, I feel you. Yeah. Okay. Mm. It's like, you know, positivity is contagious. Yeah, or like having a co-founder. This is like the first business I've done school with a co-founder. And Paul Graham, this like, who owns Y Combinator, this big VC firm, he says, 
he strongly recommends co-founders because generally one of you won't be like depressed and mm. that's very essential to bring the other one out and i've found that to be true as well i think that's also what makes a a, a wife or a husband work so well right because yeah, yeah, generally one of one of you is like what are you doing like <laughs> yeah you know to that point what i've noticed is so we recently implemented have you heard of eos entrepreneur operating system or something yeah mm. the you know that book traction mm. so we recently implemented that system in our company and one of the things that it uh, requires for is an integrator kind of like mm. a coo she was the obvious she was a, an obvious choice she had been coming up through the company and um and it's been it's now looking back at it it's like how the fuck did I run a company without a person side by side me that thinks completely different because I'm more of the visionary. I go out there, I make things work, but I'm not the the day-to-day -day stuff. Like, I, like as you said, I, I build things and then I get bored. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not going to manage it, you know? And she's more of, I don't want to be in the front. I don't give a shit. I want to be in the back. I want to make things work. You go dream, you bring it back, and I'll make it work. Mm. And you're 100% right. So you've got one of them now? I do have one of them now. Yeah. In person or remote? Everyone is remote. Oh, okay. Yeah, everyone's remote. How do you like remote? You know, so this was one of the questions that I always had as I had probably like more than five or six people. And especially as I was getting mentored by you because you had an office and I know part of your like uh, vision was like having offices all over the world and stuff like that. And I always dreamed of that. Um... Personally, I like it, but I do see that it has its its downs. Mm. But I'm just thinking, like, especially in today's world, I mean, I don't know. You know, if we're going to grow, say, to a billion-dollar-year company, we're talking about five, six, seven hundred, maybe a thousand people. Can you get that many people in one place? I don't know. I mean, they don't necessarily all need to be in person, but maybe I feel like at some point the leadership team might get together. Another idea that we had was, um, so we got together for the first time in Miami in September, and that was awesome. We also had some HR issues come out of that, which we resolved. Luckily, no one went to jail, but um, an idea we had was, what if we do, I don't know what they're called, but quarterly, because again, for EOS, it, it calls for quarterly meetings. And we like the in-person. We've done our in-person leadership meetings. Mm -hmm. So what if we take a month and then every quarter we do in different parts of the world because, you know, with the USA, COVID restrictions, a lot of people couldn't come. And we say rent out a place. When we launch a mastermind, we can host that mastermind there. We can have our quarterly meeting there. And we can have the team come in and out and kind of work in that place for a month obviously we wouldn't expect people to come and stay there for a month but like come in and out from all over the world and then it would be in different places of the world that way everyone from all around can come and join mm. and it, it'll build that culture and it's not like we're committing to something hard you know what i mean yeah it was an idea we we're throwing around have you heard of that before yeah i've heard of things like that okay. like you should listen to this joe rogan podcast episode with this guy called mark andreessen okay yeah um He's super smart, but Andreessen Horowitz is the name of his, A16Z is the name of his company. Okay. And it's like the biggest, it's the biggest VC firm in, in the world. Okay. Um, but they went from in-person to remote. And what they did is they took the budget they would typically spend on real estate. Mm. And they did quarterly retreats. Nice. At a resort. Yeah. And they covered people's flights and things. Um, and they paid for everything there. And it was for like, I think it was for three or four days. Mm. And it was mandatory for everyone. Because, you know, if they're not in the office or anything, or there is no office, then they have to come to these. Mm. And so it's every 90 days. And he said it worked really well because you could do a retroactive on the last 90. So day one's like work, retroactive and then plan. Yeah. Right? 90 day plans work really good. Yeah. And then the next two or three days is just fun. Yeah. Just hanging out. Yeah. Um and that work that seems to be working really well for them. Mm. Um Yeah. Yeah, I think some nice hybrid things are, 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 
I think pure remote is too it wears on people. Yeah. Yeah, so we've got a kind of hybrid setup <clears throat> with school. Like not everyone's in person, but we still have an office and the thing I've found is I need the people really close to me, I need to have in person like full time with me. In terms of like your direct reports? It's mostly the people I need to interface with on a day to day basis to okay. do my job. Okay. I just I have to do a lot of Zoom and everything already. And sometimes if I just I just can't be fucked like doing mm. another call, you know? And yeah. the other thing is I have to do a lot of creative work, right? And if I'm honest, like most of my really great creations were like accidents. So interesting. I wouldn't have scheduled something. Like you need to schedule something to have a call, right? Sure. I swear some of the best convers some of the best creations that have happened for school happened over lunch. Every single time. That's why we've got that little lunch area yeah, out there. Yeah. We do an hour lunch every day, like where we just hang out. And honestly, some of the most productive hours happen there. Um, so, but we don't have our whole team in office, right? But just a few people around me I have in person and I need that. Um, yeah. I think that can work. Like you could have a few of your people around you or your leadership team or whatever, yeah. like really close. Mm. And then you could have everyone else remote because there has to be some like beating heart of the company. Sure. And I don't know, maybe you're totally fine just being pure remote, but it depends. Does it ever, do you ever just get down or like, does your energy get sucked or? Um, no, I mean, personal energy, Yes and no, but I have kind of some some tools to like bring up my energy back up. Um, that again, I've learned from Tony Robbins. Mm. Um, but in terms of the team, I feel like we've maintained a high level of culture, which kind of um, which keeps that energy up. Obviously, you'll have the the one offs here and there, but I do agree one hundred percent. Like that event in September, I mean. It was it was like energy for weeks after mm, that, you yeah. know? And we scheduled to have one annual and everyone's like, Can we at least do two? Mm. Yeah. So yeah, I do see how, how that could be beneficial. Mm. Yeah. It's funny, it's always the small things that really get people's spirits up. Like I've this year with school, like we've been crushing it and it's been it's been growing really really fast and all of our by the numbers it's amazing you know we kept showing the team like look at look at our growth look yeah. at the revenue look at look at the valuation look at all of the stuff this is how much your stock's worth and you know people are like cool but i i noticed on their face they weren't like fuck yeah this is awesome and i kept talking to nick who's my my integrated guy yeah and i was like why aren't they so can't they see like all of this and he yeah. was like yeah i don't know but then we went out and, you know, I don't usually drink, but I was like, screw it. I'm going <laughs> to, I want to do an experiment. I want to see if, because I know I personally will be less productive because the next day I'm not going to be able to sure. do much. But what if the it lifted the team's spirits? Yeah. What would happen if the whole team felt better for weeks? Would that be more productive? So I was like, okay, I'm going to do an experiment. I just had some beers, hung out with everyone and... Then they all were having beers and everything and having fun. And then, you know, for weeks after that, I could notice people when they showed up to the Zoom meetings and everything, everyone's like smiling at each other way more. Mm. And we were way more productive. And so I was like, well, that, okay, maybe I'm going to drink again, like <laughs> for the company, like every now and then. Um, the other one was when we even, we got merch. You got merch? Yeah. Interesting. Which is so funny, right? We're yeah. like, we told the team, hey, everyone, like, we got you, like, a sweatshirt and a T-shirt. And everyone was like, yeah, this is awesome. And I was like, holy shit, that was way easier than I thought. Like, <laughs> we've been trying to build a company and showing people equity and all of this. But yeah. it's things like that that really get people amped up. You know what I noticed, again, having gone through this down year a little bit, and obviously we're talking about culture fits. We're not talking about everybody because you will have people that will fall off the train. But 
the people that are really here for the long term, the money won't, if the money isn't all isn't there, but two things are there for them. Number one is growth, personal growth, not materialistic growth. And number two, culture. Mm. And this is the thing that it's like a theme that I'm seeing having higher, you know, our company now has about, I don't know, 50 people or something like that. And we've had over 250 people come through and, and you know, over the years. And this is a common theme that I see. Obviously, when the money is there, people are excited. But the thing that they are most excited for, like we've literally had people, we've had to let go a lot of our salespeople because, again, we couldn't match, you know, the, the amount of sales we had with marketing. And a few of them were like, could I just hang out and come to the meetings? Like just, you know, be able to, to join the meetings and stuff like that because I'm learning so much. Mm. And we've literally had like sales reps making like $1,500 a month, $2,000 a month. Stick around because the self-development that's happening within the team, the culture, the environment, the working conditions are so awesome that for them it's like, dude, I, like, I would pay for this. The fact that I'm here doing all this and getting paid, like shit, okay, mm. I'll stay. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I learned that after a while. It's like how people feel. Right. That's super important. Because people won't like take pain for money. Right. I mean, there's probably some people that will. But, yeah. you know, the gen the vast majority won't. It's, you know, the money is important. It can't be removed or like completely forgotten about. Sure. But it's mostly how people like feel. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, especially in today's world. I think maybe 20, 30, 50 years ago was a little different, but now with so many opportunities out there, yeah. I think it's different. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Mm -hmm. mm. Oh, and on your harmony thing, your work life harmony thing, another thing I thought you might find interesting, but I at my home is like also where the health stuff is. So like, we're putting a um, infrared sauna in. Oh, nice. There. Okay. There's a gym in the garage there. Nice. And the, um, like I'm gonna put a like, cold plunge kind of thing in there okay. too. So that when I'm in that environment, it's like, that's the environment for like rest, sleep, like family, presence, and health and exercise and nourishment. You know what I mean? I love that. Yeah, and then when I come here, it's it's like it's work. Yeah, yeah, I love that. So you got to kind of, I think of them as worlds too. Like, yeah, I go into that world, and then I go into this world. Mm. I think you have to create something like that. I've heard a lot of people talk about this too. Like Kobe Bryant talked a lot about it. Um, I think it's very hard to just be everything in one place in right. the same environment. There's like triggers that bring you into it. I think that the, the thing is like the reason why that happens oftentimes is you want to be efficient, you know, and it's like, well, if I have to like, especially with the, when with today's world where you can work remote and we, you can do everything from anywhere, it's like, well, if I, you know, instead of driving to work and getting stuck in traffic and stuff like that, well, I, that's a, an hour every day that I can, that I can put into back to work, mm. you know? Um, but the thing that I'm realizing is sometimes those are the things that are going to take you away from the work or whatever else that's like consuming a lot of your time where, where, where you can go back to equilibrium, you know, where you can go back to like balance and have that, that balance, you know, or that integration, whatever you want to call it, you know, mm. where you have some time for other things rather than just work. Yeah. Mm. And there's also some space for like, there's like. <clears throat> white space in a way for like things to pop into sure because i i drive like it takes me about 25 30 minutes each way so i spend an hour a day driving now okay and the old me would have thought like that is a complete waste of time yeah um but i listen to that's the time that i actually get to listen to some podcasts okay so because i can't listen to podcasts when i'm working because it's talking so like right. it doesn't work or i listen to music and just think and i actually have learned to quite enjoy that drive now i mm. also got a car that makes it enjoyable right sure so i don't think it's less productive because 
yeah, you're changing modes and you're giving yourself some space to think. Because often we just schedule everything or we're constantly doing stuff. When are we ever just... Just doing nothing. Yeah, well, often people say it happens in the shower, it happened on a walk, you know, where this, where this idea or insight came to them. It's interesting you say that because I used to hate flying and this year I've done more flying than I ever have. And it's usual like masterminds and this thing and that event and visiting family or whatever. And now I actually love flying. And the longer the flight, the more I like it mm. because that's when I do a lot of thinking. And, uh, and it was funny because two weeks ago, Aaron was, uh, so he lives in Italy and he was coming to the US or I think this time when he went to Colts thing and it's like Italy to the US, I don't know how many hours, like 10 hours or 15 hours or something. And he, he was like sending me all these messages like, dude, I don't know what is happening, but I, I feel so creative when I'm on the plane, mm. you know? But it's, it's just pretty much to what you said. It's like you have this, this time where there are no, those regular day-to-day -day distractions, and you have some time for yourself to like do whatever the fuck you want. And usually the, the internet on the plane is pretty shoddy, so you can't just like get on your phone or computer and do like work. Mm. And you're just like forced to sit with yourself. And that's when your brain starts working, you know? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's definitely, definitely true. Yeah, I used to approach things very different. It would be like, everything was remote. Right. And everything is planned. There's no room for like things to kind of just happen. And I wouldn't just go to an event just thinking, maybe something will happen. But I do that a lot now. I just go to one and I'm just like, we'll see what happens yeah and then i'm like if it does if nothing good comes of it then i probably will go to less but if something good comes from it then i probably will go to more yeah just leaving chance or like what i was talking about earlier like leaving room for serendipity and it's been really really good i think way more people need to get out of their house and just go to an event and just see what happens do nothing yeah well, and just leave time to do nothing right right Mm. It, and it's like kind of like what I was also telling you earlier about the notes thing. Like I'll see people, and, and this mm. used to be me. I would go to events and I would literally be burning through pages of notes. And then I would go back. First of all, my handwriting sucks. And especially when I'm like hearing something and I'm like writing it fast, it's like I would look back and it's like, what the fuck does it say? I, I, what was I thinking? Because when you're sometimes when you're writing something, you're in a completely different mindset. And then when you come back to read it, like on a on a, on a a cold, calm mind, it's like, wait, this does not make any sense. And so now what I do is I intentionally show up to events without a notebook, without a pen. If I hear something that like sticks out to me where it's like, holy shit, that was awesome. Like for example, something that like, Tony has really good one-liners something that stuck to me, he said, you will get what you tolerate. That stuck to me. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow, that's good. I pulled up my notes and I wrote it down. And then at the end of like three, four day event, I'll look back and I'll say, okay, how many notes do I have? How many like points do I have? If I have more than 12 or 15, I'll start deleting. Let's bring them down to like, you know, like 10 or something. And then I'll put up my top three. These are the top three that I really, really, really enjoy. And then like, it really sits with me. I know they're gonna make a big impact, you know? And then I just leave it at that and that's it. And mm. I'll try to review them like on a weekly basis or something until yeah. I don't need them anymore. Yeah, I see that. That's, mm. I see some people doing what you're talking about, like furious note taking. Yeah. And then the breaks come and they go away, like back to their room or whatever. <laughs> And I'm like, man, you're totally missing it. That's yeah. what it's. That's what people like think logically in event is, right? Content. Yeah. And to be productive, you you take a lot of notes in the content, and then you go away. Yeah. But, and that's how I used to do it. But I've learned over time that it's the breaks where most of the value happens. One hundred percent. And it's the dinners. It's hanging out, and that's really where most of the value is. Right, now let me ask you a question. So there is the other argument of when you write something, your brain m memorizes it more. So what do you think about that? Because there's people, like I've literally met a few people where they're like, I do nothing with my notes. I write it just because I know I'll remember it. So I approach it slight, you wanna know how I do it? Yeah. 
So, well, first, what do you think of that? If you write something down, do you remember it more? Um, yes and no, because, you know, like writing something down is a way to kind of empty your RAM, your random access, like rapid access memory. Okay. So you get it out of your head and onto the page, which gives you the ability to be like, oh, I can forget about it. Okay. Right? Um, so, but, so, you know, in a way it actually makes it harder to remember something. Okay. But of course you have it written down, so you're going to be able to, you don't need to remember it. You can go and get it. Right. Yeah. But also, yeah, I don't know. I haven't spent too long thinking about that. But the thing I do is I just, I, I try to notice like patterns and themes. Okay. So I'll be just listening to things, hanging out, not pushing, not trying to like, not trying to force anything like in my conversations with people and stuff, just being very like empty, right? And then just seeing what happens, overhearing other people's conversations and just kind of like letting serendipity happen. And after a while, I'll notice that there's like something, there's a theme. Mm. And that theme is like the real thing that I'm learning. It's something that I've heard different sides of in all of the interactions I've had. Like some, someone might have been talking about like what it, how they're experiencing it, but they might be on the receiving end. Then someone might be talking about the problems of doing it on the other side. And then one of the presentations might have been on why, you know, you should, the future is this. Do you, do you get what I'm saying here? Yes. Yeah. And then I'm like, ah, this is what I'm, this is what I'm here for. Now, do you, um, so I get exactly what you're saying, but then when do you actually do something about something? So when do I action this right. kind of thing? Yeah. So if I've like experienced it like that, I'll probably then write it down. Got it. Yeah. Because I'm like, ah, this is like important. And it, you know, and that's just one bullet point, but it might've been brewing for like days. Okay. Yeah, so it's not like everything everyone ever said. That's just craziness. Got it. Um, but it's the big in, big piece of insight or the big discovery I had. Mm. Yeah. That's interesting. Something that I've noticed is, and maybe I'm just lower than the normal human. Um, I'll hear the same thing multiple times from different people, but then it'll take four or five, six times until, I don't know, that I just need that many times for it to act for it to actually like get registered, or maybe the right person at the right time needs to say it. You know, very simple example that we can both relate to the thing about setters. I've been hearing it for the longest time, and I've decided to push it and no, and this is complicated and blah blah blah. Until recently, before the mastermind, I don't know where where we were. We were somewhere. Um, I think it was the Grand Cardone thing. And uh, like you talked about it, Cole talked about it, and then we walked out of there and I told Aaron, we're doing this shit, mm. you know? And then now we're building Setter Steam. But again, I knew about it. It's not like this is the first time, it's not like it was an epiphany that I had never, it's, you know, it wasn't like an invention I had, I had never heard about. I've been hearing about this thing for the last like year and a half. Mm. Has that ever happened to you? Yeah. Okay. Like that occurred to me too. That's why I was talking about it. Okay. Right? Because you know, Cole's business has taken off like crazy. Right. So obviously there's something to learn in there, right? Okay. And ads are getting like harder, right? Right. And cost to book a call with call funnels is getting more expensive. Um, and people are craving more human interaction, right? So, you know, there's a lot of like things going on that make it a, the perfect moment for like setters to to make sense do you know what i mean mm. yeah so i there's these moments like right now i think it's it's pod as weird as it sounds i think podcasts really are coming into their prime now it's a very old technology right like podcasts been around forever but it's something about this particular moment how podcasts are now on video format and they're on youtube and they make great YouTube content and they lend themselves well to the YouTube algorithm, which means that they get a lot of distribution there. Whereas on iTunes and stuff, they didn't get much distribution. So if you take a podcast, you use a video format, you put it on YouTube, then you can also put it on all of the other things. Right. 
And then you can also do the shorts. It, it lends itself perfectly to find these clips and that goes out onto those channels. So it's, you could say, you know, podcasts have, do you get what I'm trying to say here? I do what you're trying to say, but here's a question. Do you think one should um, train the skill of catching these things earlier on? Like, and instead of me needing to hear setters or podcasts, you know, like a year and a half from now, I might say, well, fuck, I'm starting a podcast. But it's like, but I've known about this for two years now. Or do you think it just needs to be like the right moment and the right moment will just need to present itself and it needs to feel right, you know? I think a lot of it is you have to assess your reasons for doing something. Like you said you were, you said no to setters and no to podcasts. Right. So why? Do you have really good reasons? For setters, it was we didn't need it. Mm. So that's a very good reason. Right. And it was yeah. it just was complicated. It's like, well, this is just complicated. You know, it sounds complicated. Mm. The podcast is like, I don't want to commit to the whole thing, you know? And I don't again, I don't I don't feel I don't see the need. There are my thing, it's like my list of like it's not even on my list of priorities, let yeah. alone, you know, top or middle. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah, I get it. See, so yeah, it's like you you keep revisiting those top priorities and you keep kind of scanning through your memory bank of, of everything and sometimes things just click. Yeah. But it, yeah. But do you think one could miss out on things this way? Yes, for sure. The, like it is definitely a skill to spot it early. Mm. Yeah. But, but I think even this podcast thing is still early, by the way. Right. Mm. But do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? To spot it early? To miss out on some things. You you have to miss out on things. Right. If you try not to miss out on anything, you'll certainly fail. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because then you'll be all over the place, right? Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's the thing that that I see like in our industry and in just the whole online world that I've seen is that this FOMO oh, yeah. of people just wanting to do it all. This person said this, I'm gonna do it. Nope, but then now they said that, I'm gonna do that. But this other person said this, now I'm gonna do that, you know? Um, I haven't figured out not how to, like I haven't figured out how to address it, you know, in a way of like. For yourself? No, not for myself, for the market. Oh. I don't have, I mean, I definitely have FOMO on some things, but I'm not jumping around things, you know? Well, I mean, you can't, the market, so that's why fashion exists. <laughs> you know, like trends. Sure. Most people don't have taste. They simply copy other people. Mm. And it will always be that way, right? Interesting. Most people don't make any of their own choices. Right. Um. So it's always going to be that way. And you can't fight trends either. You have to like lean into them, but you can't get sucked into them. Mm. And you've got to know which ones are the right ones and which ones is just hype. So it's like a skill. So I'll give you a perfect example. There's like, people are talking about all sorts of crap right now, but there are some things I really do believe in that will be the future, like community, newsletters, and podcasts. I okay. think that is the future of like marketing and building an building an audience or a brand or whatever, right? The, com sure. the that perfect combination, like a free community with a podcast and a newsletter that that holds it all together. And then short form is definitely like TikTok is taking off, right? So that I think there's no denying all of that stuff, but I think it's best if you just repurpose the longer form one for that. Sure. Um, and then people are valuing people more. So like, you know, throughout many events I've heard recently, everyone's been saying the best part is during lunch or the best part is at dinner. 100%. I've heard that so many times <laughs> recently mm -hmm. that people are looking for people. And then, you know, I saw this company chief.com. Have you heard of this? I have. Yeah. 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 So it comes out of nowhere, has 15,000 customers paying 15 grand. A, a year and it's valued at like one and a half billion wow it's a mastermind but it it has physical clubs physical locations mm. 
that again just lends itself to everything we've been hearing people want to hang out with people right mm. so you know i i try to figure out what is signal what is noise and then i try to figure out how can i use that do you know what i mean yeah does this make sense 100%. it's very abstract yeah <clears throat> um i think the um the we were like we were together for such a long time and then we went away from each other for like a while and then i think now people are like finding their groove and and what's a hybrid what's good for me what's not good for me and then trying to to like i think there was a an updated level of awareness that got created over the last couple of years and this is the interesting that thing that i think always happens in in times like these when things go I don't want to say really bad, but when the the pattern is interrupted of the day to day, the grind, you're going to work, you're you know you went to college, you got a degree, blah blah blah, and then pattern interruption. COVID happened, the world got shut down. People thought they were gonna you know the the world was gonna catch on fire, and then it didn't. And then now it's like, oh, that's interesting, mm. you know. Yo, that's what I think. I think it was trending towards people. Were community was disintegrating and human rel interactions were kind of going away right remote work was becoming more of a thing right people zoning out on netflix zoom all of this stuff gaming um and that was going that way but then covid just took it to an extreme right and when you take something fully away from someone they often you are, it's very easy to know what you're missing when everything's taken away right 100 percent and so now people are like really craving it, like that human interaction. Because mm -hmm. you know, I spoke to some kids at USC, the university down there, and I was curious, I was like, would you guys and girls like prefer a job if all things were equal and one was in person and one was remote, which one would you prefer? Vast majority, 90% in person. Interesting. And I was like, whoa, this is the younger generation. I was like, why? And they said, we had to do university remote right during COVID, and it was the worst time mm. ever and they said they never want to do that again mm. well see the other thing is if you're by yourself you're now forced to get on social media and i mean let's face it man you get on social media and you can get very depressed especially if you're just an average human looking at like like sometimes instagram looks like a porn site <laughs> and i'm just like when did we become okay with this just being public like like any age can just see this stuff, you know? And so like, let's say a, 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 a teenage girl, you know, someone that's in high school or something like that. And she's looking at Instagram at these hot models that, you know, that God knows what they've done with themselves or their pictures. And then now she's comparing herself to them. And so she's at home just like depressed looking at this. So the community is gonna like take her away from that and, and put her with humans that she can resonate with and she can relate with, mm. you know? Yeah. Mm. Oh yeah. It's, that's why I think the biggest things in the future are in-person things, which is funny though, because like, you know, there's a lot of focus on the metaverse and AI and all of this stuff. Right. But I think it's, it's less of that. It's more of interaction with people. But don't you think we've also been able to find a way to reach more people through, you know, through the internet and, and we've been more okay to do that now? Like I, for example, um, again, bringing him again, Tony Robbins, they did a challenge a few months ago and they had over a million people in there, mm -hmm. right? And he used to talk about how he used to travel like 200 days a year to all these different cities to do his events where now like 80% of his events are virtual and he does some in person, but he only does them in his backyard. You know, so if you want to come great, if you don't want to come, that's fine, get online, you know, and he's able to impact more people. He's able to reach more people. So for him, it's more of a, of a plus leaning towards the virtual rather than in person, you know? Yeah. But I mean, that's his preference, right? Cause he doesn't want to travel all the time. Sure. But what would the audience want more? Mm. right i don't know i mean personally from my experience i attended one event 
two times, virtual and in person. The in person had completely different energy, mm. although the the virtual was great as well. But then I'm thinking about will I travel again for this? Like he's got a a, a business mastery thing coming up in January. And I'm like I've already traveled November and December for his events. You know, and for me it's like an hour drive, so it's not like I'm going anywhere. But it's like hotel and you know just it's just weird you know like mm. get a pack and go and drive and stuff like that to me it's like th that's just too much traveling i'm just going to do it from home mm. you know but i wouldn't mind doing them in person every now and then yeah you know but it, i guess it comes back to how do you have those mo moments during the breaks and at din the dinners right when it's virtual yeah yeah i mean they do like breakout rooms and stuff like that but obviously it's not the same Mm. yeah yeah so it removes that 100 percent. yeah so yeah. yeah you can get the content oh yeah right but and tony can reach more people but will that that magic that happens you know when the people collide with each other yeah i think that gets kind of removed mm. Mm. so i mean i'm not saying one's like the answer obviously re remote like isn't going anywhere virtual isn't going anywhere it has a, a place, but people are craving the other one more. And there is some kind of magic that happens with the other one. 100%. Mm. So I would think, how can you kind of leverage both? 